Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. And today we have with us Samuel Sanders, who's an entrepreneur, speaker, and the author of Your Next Big Idea. Samuel, welcome to the program. Mike, thank you so much for having me. So I'm excited to talk to you. I want to hear about your background and your book, but I like the title because it presupposes that you already had a big idea and now we want to help you get to your next one. So, so it's not just like, you know, how to get your first big idea. It's like, okay, you got some momentum going here, you know, your next big idea. So um, give us a little bit of a, a background on yourself and then what led you to um, write this book. Yeah. So when I talk about my background, I typically uh, split it in three parts. So the first part of my career, I spent uh, working at an Inc. 5000 uh, fastest growing company. I worked on uh, in HR. I did uh, marketing and R&D as well and really got a sense of how a small company, you know, quickly innovates. Uh, the second part of my career is more of my own stuff. I started my own company, Wondershirt, and I had a fantastic uh, co-founder, Michael Shaw. Uh, and that was a performance athletic clothing company. You would compete with someone like Nike or Under Armour, um, built that entire supply chain from scratch. And at its peak, we were selling uh, shirts to Olympic athletes training for the 2016 Olympics. The last part of my career that I talk about uh, is I worked for a Fortune Future 50, Fortune 500 company, and I did a large amount of work for them, both like nitty gritty work, but also high level business development work. Um, and proposal writing. So taking a look at both the small, fast-moving company, uh, my my own experience as an entrepreneur, and, you know, the large company experience of innovation and creativity, that's what led me to where I am today. Um, and today I'm working on two projects. I have Heard LLC, which is a software program that helps governments connect with citizens more effectively, or large companies connect with uh, employees more effectively. And I'm writing a book, uh, Your Next Big Idea, which you uh, talked about a little bit there. And I think that's the reason why I'm here. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited to talk about that. So what was the genesis of that? I mean, you were, you know, uh, uh, going about your day and, and running your business. And then at what point do you think, you know, there's a book in this concept? Yeah, so that's a great question. Basically, as I was going through my day, I started to get, uh, I started to realize that I kind of had the background of how large companies think about innovation, how small, fast companies think about innovation, and how you know, founders themselves think about startups and innovation. And they're all slightly different. And part of the problem is that in business school or when you go online to learn about you know business, they they teach you about the final product, which I which I find. Uh, a little bit frustrating. They'll talk about Apple or Amazon and how they're so great, but they don't talk about like the garage they were built in and how they got there. And there's a, actually a company that's like a fascinating case study of this. It's uh, Nintendo, which most people don't realize this, but Nintendo started as playing cards, like a deck of cards. And huh. they've done all different types of products. They've gone into the taxi business. They've made rice. But when we talk about Nintendo, we always think of, you know, the video game systems that they make. And we don't talk about the pivots they've had to make, the business, you know, the different business decisions they made when uh, spawning off new potential products. And that's frustrating. So I wanted to write a book to help people understand how to think, how people come up with big ideas. And, you know, you use innovation, and I like that phrase and that concept, and I would like to get your opinion on this because I feel like a lot of people um, misassume that innovation means some brand new idea that no one's ever thought of, and I'm innovating, but in reality, an element of innovation is to make something bigger, faster, stronger, better, that kind of thing. So what is your take on innovation? Yeah, that's a great question. Innovators are like really, they just really examine the world around them really uh, like effectively. They look at what is working, but they can also look at how things can be improved. They take a look at really successful businesses, but then also where they're failing. And that's kind of the innovation in it. Sometimes you have 
like someone who comes up with a brand new idea. And oftentimes, if that's the case, you're really talking in high tech science or health. But most of the time, it's just tweaking or working with a lot of the things that are out there in a a new way. And that's innovation. It kind of has like a scary tone to it. Like, oh, it's such a, you know, like big thing. But really, I think we all could be innovative. We just need to understand how to think about different ideas. Yeah, I mean, you think about, um, uh, and maybe this is just my perspective, but um, one day there was no such thing as a website, and then we had <laughs> websites, and then yeah. one day there was no such thing as an app, right? On your Like on your phone, you could yeah. go to a website, but then there was an app. Well, um, if you then uh, compare that to one day, you had to, you know, you had to take a taxi everywhere you went, and then uh, one day someone uh, started this company called Uber that said, let's not own a bunch of taxis, let's just connect people with apps to transportation, and now that's an innovation in transportation. So... Um, I would I would just say as an entrepreneur, where do you find entrepreneurs or recommend that they start if they're going to if you want them to think, okay, be innovative and there could be an element of something branch banking new or there could be an element of what are you currently doing in your business that you can innovate and make more efficient or more productive or even more productive for your clients and your target audience. Where's that starting? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like you say Uber, but also Facebook is a great example. Like they're not the first social media company, you know, out there. So it's all, it's all over the place. As someone who wants to be an innovator, someone that wants to think of ideas, what we need to do is nail down problems, needs, and wants that we face in our everyday society. So if you're looking to try and innovate, you need to understand and, and focus on like the problems you are facing, the needs that you have or your customers have, and the wants that, you're, um, that both you have and your customers have. One thing I say to people to look out for is like the word hate or annoying. When people say they hate something or something is really annoying, that's indicating there's a problem there that they would potentially pay for to solve. Uh, we need to look at that kind of uh, language as a potential opportunity. So often we tune out things that are uncomfortable, things that we don't like, problems we face. But if we really focus on them and look to try and solve them, that's where the innovation comes in. Yeah. Well, you think about it, most companies or most you know entrepreneurial ventures are in reality solutions to a problem that your yeah. target audience has. So what is that problem? And you hear it on Shark Tank so many times. It's like, where's the problem? (laughs) Are we solving a a real problem with this thing? Because I don't see the problem. And so I think that if you can really zone in on that and then go, okay, well, there's the solution. Well, then how can I make it better? And how can I make that better? And how can I make that better? And it's really like um, there's like a questioning technique to kind of get to the bottom of everything. And, hey, what's important to you uh, about this issue and you'll go, oh, well, it's important because, and then, okay, good. Well, hey, what's important to you about that? Oh, well, and then you go like three, four levels deep and you really get to the heart of the matter. So if you can really think about the solution to that problem, maybe your next big idea is right in front of you because it's an innovation of what you're currently doing. Yeah, that's a great point. And these things change and we need to be constantly looking at, you know, the problem needs and wants. Today's problems, needs, and wants are not going to be the same as 10 years from now. Like we need to be examining. And even if we have like a really good business or product, look into it, see if there are problems, needs, wants that we can focus on and continue to innovate. It's important not to be complacent. Yeah. So um, then what's the next step? Once an entrepreneur kind of has some inkling of what they need to do to uh, uh, innovate, what are some things that they need to do to make sure creativity is, you know, moving forward? And then on the other hand, what are some things that slow down creativity and then keep that innovation from even happening in the first place? Yeah. So once you really have uh, that idea or that, I'm sorry, that problem, then it's time to formulate the ideas around how to solve that problem. And there are a couple of Uh, points that I like to point out. I call them stigmas and I talk about more in my book, uh, Your Next Big Idea, but I'm going to just point out three here that slow down that creative process or make it more challenging. The first is uh, social influence. This is like if the top people are doing something, then I'll feel like I need to do something. For example, if McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group are recommending a new project management style there's a good chance a lot of people are going to be like, well, those are the top consulting companies. I might as well do this project management style. But in reality, 
you know, that maybe isn't the best for your company. Maybe, you know, you need to relook at how you do project management. It could be something different, but we, we fall for that social influence. The second is habits we form. So think about a birthday. Like at every single birthday, there's pretty much cake. And that's something that we have been, you know, <laughs> you know, done as a society over and over. And it's sort of a habit. But if you have a birthday for somebody who is a, you know, really focusing on getting in shape or a fitness influencer, they're probably not going to want cake at their birthday. But because you have that habit, you may still think like, oh, that would make sense. The last uh, creativity cycle or, or stigma is how we phrase, view, or present information. And this is really important when you're doing research because data can be skewed both at how it's being presented or how it's being said. So for example, like if you take a graph and say, you know, the axes are not starting at zero, there are like lots of little tricks you can do to skew the data. Or if I come to you and I say, hey, 2% of your employees don't like your management style, or I come to you and I say, hey, only 2% of your employees don't like your management style, that's going to send a really different message. And it's important to look at where this, uh, the information is coming from and look at how it's being shown or presented. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because um, you want other people's opinion and sometimes the opinion you're looking for is data and it depends on your bias of you coming into approaching that data or gathering it. Um, sometimes yeah. data is included or not and like it or not, we all have a bias. I mean, you, we can think of example after example. You know, I've, I've heard one recently where it's like you're broke down on the side of the road and someone you're flagging down someone and a female email stops, do you feel really, really comfortable? And most people would go, no, I want some dude with a lug wrench. And so we uh, all have, yeah. <laughs> you know, we all have bias. Um, so here's another one related to that, that I think that is one too. Hey, I've got this really cool, innovative idea and I want to get some feedback. So I'm going to go do what I've been told to do, which is ask people's opinion. But you find yourself only going to the people that you kind of know are going to give you like, hey, that's an awesome idea. Why don't you yeah. go to the people that you might think, uh, no, that's really not a good idea, and here's why. Because maybe in their rejection of that idea, they're not rejecting the whole concept. They're just kind of saying, hey, let's give pause to this. Why don't you consider? Why don't you polish this up? And I think that we all find ourselves going to our yes people too often, and then maybe that's not the best you know, approach. Yeah, and I think it's really important as an entrepreneur or as a business leader to talk about those things that make you uncomfortable. If you're, uh, if, if you're only going to yes people, that's, that's not helpful for you. If you're only willing to, you know, take advice from certain people or uh, take uh, stop, you know, stop the car for certain people, that's, that's not helpful. That's not, that's not going to lead to success and putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations is something that can really project your business and your market research forward to help you make sure that you're moving forward with the best idea. Yeah, so what do you do to avoid that? So if you're working with someone to say, we need to get the best research, what are some th triggers that they need to have in their mind to make sure that they're going after the best research it, with the best light? Yeah, so things I look for is first, when you have any idea, you need to ask, is there a market for this idea? Yeah. There are so many times where I see people create really, really, truly innovative ideas, but they don't really have a market and that's not going to lead to success. It may be something that's really, you know, great, but if it doesn't have people that are interested in it, you, you're not really going to be successful. So you're really going to have to dive into that market research, see how many people would be actually interested see how many people would be more than interested in purchase, uh, be willing to purchase, whether people face the same problems that this product or service is solving. That's the first step. The second step is asking, does the market want it now? Hmm. There's this really interesting uh, look at timing, and it, uh, it's done by Bill Gross of Idea Lab, and it, it shows that when you look at things like founder, business uh, concepts, timing, and other factors that lead to a business's success, the timing is actually one of the most important aspects. If I'm creating a new typewriter now, that's just not going to be successful 
maybe it would have been successful when typewriters are popular, but I just don't have the right timing for it. And also if I'm from the reverse angle, if I'm creating something like, I don't know, a, a teleporting machine that would come with some skepticism. Now yeah. there would be like, how are you doing that? I don't know if I'm ready for that. Is this good for my health? Like yeah. there would be pushback. So it's important to really understand is the market ready for this now? The last thing is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. You finish, you finish uh, that last thing. Cause I've got a follow up question to that. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. So um, the last thing is just asking whether you have the resources to actually move forward with your idea. Can I, if I'm trying to build a rocket ship, I don't have the resources to do that. You know, I have to ask like, what can I do on my own? What do I have in house with my business? Do I have, you know, employees that, that can pull off this idea? Can I get it from an external source or can I bring someone to my team to help push through on the idea? So those are the three things you really need to ask. A hundred percent. And I know in, in the book that you talk about um, learning to innovate um, by examining the world around you. And I think that that sounds really cool to go, yeah, observe, observe the world around you. It's kind of like how stand up comedians are so funny because they go, you know how we go up and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how do you teach <laughs> someone to, I guess, properly examine the world around them? Because I think that we all tend to be so fast paced, focused on ourself and maybe not you know, really observing in the right way because, yeah, we can observe that, okay, I'm, you know, going to this place and driving down this street, but how do you observe the world around you in your sphere so that you can observe and watch for potential innovations to work in your business? I think that that's a really interesting concept there. Yeah. So the biggest thing I tell people is, we're so goal oriented oftentimes as entrepreneurs that we are focused on the end point and we sometimes have that tunnel vision but if you're getting whacked around on your way to getting to that end point that's something to notice it's the things that slow you down that you should take note of and often are really good ideas for innovation now in the right in your regular uh day-to-day -day life if it's, you know, we all have errands and things that we need to do, we need to go to work. We have to focus on the things that, that frankly suck, like that, that slow us down and are not comfortable. And think about how we could solve them. It's really easy and comfortable as humans to just kind of throw that aside, be like, oh, that was annoying, you know, on to the next thing. But if we think about how to solve them, maybe write them down, give them to even some other people to talk about, that's where we really can find innovative ideas and in the long run, hopefully solve some of these problems we have. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, I, I loved how we've been talking about innovations all surrounding your uh, new book, your next big idea, because it is about creativity. It is about problem solving, but innovation is like the cool, you know, buzzword in business today. So if you yeah. <laughs> can figure out how to innovate by improving creativity, how to solve better problems creatively and with, you know, innovation, I think that that really excites your, your team, uh, your internal team. So I'm really excited uh, for you about this book. Let's uh, wrap up, uh, Samuel, with what's the best way people can reach out, connect with you, learn more about your, your uh, book and pick up a copy. Yes. Yeah, so you can check out the book by going to yournextbigideabook.com. The book comes out May 3rd, and I'd love if you picked up a copy. I expand a lot more on some of the topics we talked about today in the book. Uh, or you can contact me and go to herdllc.com if you're curious about some of the business that I work on. And uh, I'd love to connect. Shoot me an email. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Samuel, thank you so much for coming on today. It was a real pleasure talking with you. Yeah, Mike, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.